Whoa, crazy computer. Taxonomy is um, grouping things. And uh, so this is obviously grouping living things is what we're going to be concerned with in biology. And so we say that there are these things that are called taxonomical classification groups, or um, you can also just call them taxons, right? And um, there's an ordering of the taxons from the least specific to the most specific. And the way that I remember this is by remembering that dumb King Philip came over from Great Spain. Now the, uh, the saying always used to be, dumb King Philip came over from German soil. That's like the one that it even says like online if you search for it and, and in the textbook and stuff. But about uh, four years ago now, uh, I had George Bentley in the class and he informed me that there's never been a King Philip in Germany. Uh, and so that was a bad thing that you wouldn't want him to come over from German soil because there's no King Philip. But there were King Philips in Spain and so he suggested Great Spain and that's where we are now. So, um, <laughs> This is how it works. Domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So most specific is species, obviously. Least specific is domain, right? Or in some cases, kingdom, based on uh, what we're about to learn, which is how ridiculous this system actually is, okay? So let's talk for a second about the three domain system. Three domain system was added on to our original five kingdom system, right? So they, they used to just be five kingdoms and well, there used to be actually just three kingdoms. And then in the like late fifties, early sixties, they were like, wait a second, it's definitely not three, it should be five, right? And then uh, they were like, wait a second, we, we messed up again because we pretty much thought that all little things, all prokaryotes like bacteria and stuff, were like, oh, those are pretty much all the same because they're all pretty small, right? But then as our technology increased and we learned about like microscopes of different types and we learned how to do DNA analysis, we learned that um, there is as much, if not more diversity within the prokaryotic um, realm as there is within the eukaryotic realm, right? And so uh, it was silly because we grouped all prokaryotes into just a single kingdom before. And so we came up with a three domain system in order to uh, recognize the fact that, that prokaryotes are also really diverse, okay? So we'll say that this is a system created to help classify the diverse group groups of prokaryotes. So there are, there are three different um, domains. The domains are as follows. Bacteria, archaea, and eukaryota. Bacteria, archaea, and eukaryota, okay? So, this is weird because um, when we look at our five kingdoms, uh, you guys might know the five kingdoms, I don't know, we'll see. Uh, the five kingdoms are Monera, Protista, Fungi, Animalia, and Plantae. Those are the five kingdoms. 
And so the weird thing about this is if you look at the way that the five kingdoms are, are separated versus the way that the three domains are separated, bacteria goes into Monera. Writer belongs to the kingdom Monera. Monera. Archaea belongs to the kingdom Monera. And then Eukaryota represents the other four kingdoms. And so you can sort of see why this was necessary to add domain above, because otherwise we just grouped all prokaryotes into the exact same um, kingdom, which was the kingdom Monera, and we know now that prokaryotes are really, 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 really diverse, and that if you compared a bacteria to an archaea, it would be similar to comparing like a giraffe to a cactus or something like that. They're, they're extremely different. And to say that they're the same is, is just ridiculous and it doesn't help you from a, a taxonomy standpoint um, because they're really not similar. And if you put them in the same grouping, then people think that they're similar even though they're not, okay? Even this uh, five kingdom system that we have here is bad. Everybody agrees that it's bad, um, but we kind of can't agree on a new one, right? So there's been a lot of other kingdom systems that have been suggested. There's been a seven kingdom system suggested. There's been an eight kingdom su su system suggested, a 10, a 13, and a 15, right? The problem is that this is a biology subject, and in biology, there's no governing body for biology, right? So in um, physics, You've got like CERN, and CERN is like the the end all be all of physics. And if CERN says something is so, then that's going to be the thing, right? In chemistry, you've got this um, organization called IUPAC, and IUPAC is the one that names new elements and stuff. And if IUPAC says something is that way, then that's the way that it is in chemistry. But in biology, there's no grouping that says, hey, we're going to have seven kingdoms now, or hey, we're going to have fifteen kingdoms now. There's just a bunch of universities saying, hey, it would be great if we split this up into 13 kingdoms or seven kingdoms or whatever. And so the last thing that we can agree on is when we agreed that there were five and we published it in a whole bunch of textbooks. And so that's why we haven't done away completely with this five kingdom system and why it still exists, even though it's pretty bad. And you'll see as we start going through the kingdoms why it's so bad. Okay, so let's talk about the five kingdom system. <coughs> We'll start off with the uh, group Monera. Okay, we're going to put the, um, the major classifications or the major things that you have to have in order to get into that kingdom uh, as the very first bullet point, and then we'll end on everything else. Okay, so in order to get into the kingdom Monera, your characteristic that you must have is prokaryotic. Anything that's prokaryotic, no matter what, goes into the kingdom Monera, okay? So, from there, then, we can say uh, that there's some differentiation between these, these um, prokaryotic organisms that are in there. There's bacteria, and bacteria are classified as having their own unique set of ribosomes. We've talked about this before when we talked about the endosymbiotic theory. We said that mitochondria have very similar ribosomes to uh, bacteria, and we know that those are different than eukaryotic bacteria or eukaryotic ribosomes, rather. So we can say that they have unique uh, bacterial ribosomes. Right? They have circular chromosomes or a circular chromosome, rather, a single, singular one, with no entrons. That means no non-coding regions. Everything in a bacteria's chromosome does something, right? Circular chromosome with no entrons. They all have a cell wall. And those cell walls in bacteria always have one common characteristic in them, and they all contain a um, compound called peptidoglycan. 
Okay, now sometimes it's in really high concentrations and sometimes it's in much lower concentrations. And so we'll talk about later uh, that that gives us two different groupings of bacteria, one that we refer to as gram negative and one that we refer to as gram positive. And that's based on um, the composition of their cell wall and how much peptidoglycan is in it. But there's always some, right? That's one of the things that they have to have in order to be classified as bacteria, okay? Then you've got this other grouping that's called archaea. Thank you. Uh, and archaea have um, chromosomes, or sorry, not chromosomes, but ribosomes that are much more similar to eukaryotic ribosomes. Their chromosomes uh, are able to contain both entrons and exons. And they have super diverse cell walls. So they're made of diverse compounds, okay? So when we talk about taxonomy, one of the things that we're trying to get to or be able to do is to figure out um, like as far as life goes and evolution goes, like where did certain things evolve from? What are they most similar to, okay? And so um, when we look at eukaryotes, at eukaryotic organisms, we can see that eukaryotic organisms have the most in common with archaea, right? They have entrons and exons and they have ribosomes that are similar, okay? But we can also see that the mitochondria that are contained within eukaryotes have um, characteristics similar to bacteria, right? They've got their own unique bacterial ribosomes and they've got circular chromosomes with no entrons, right? And so when we go back to that endosymbiotic theory, we can actually get a little bit more specific on it now. We can say in the endosymbiotic theory, it was very likely that in archaea, a primitive archaea engulfed a primitive bacteria because the main eukaryotic cell is the most similar to archaea, whereas the mitochondria that, have, that were the thing that got engulfed, those are more similar to bacteria, right? Make sense? Okay, so um, along this whole cell walls being made out of a, a bunch of diverse compounds, um, those diverse compounds are going to allow them to specialize. And one of the things that archaea are known for is um, specializing in living in extreme environments that nothing else can live in, right? We call them often extremophiles. Archaea are often extremophiles. Living in hostile environments. Okay, so extreme temperatures, be it very hot or very cold, right? Um, extreme salt concentrations, we call those halophiles, right? They can live in uh, places like the Dead Sea that have really, really, really high salt concentrations that wouldn't allow most life to live in. Uh, the cell walls of these archaea allow them to function in those specific environments. Okay, all right. So uh, the next group, let's talk about fungi. Kingdom fungi. All right, so like I said, we're gonna put the, um, the necessary uh, characteristics in um, the first spot here, and I'm actually gonna highlight it too. So this is, these are the characteristics that you actually absolutely have to have in order to get in there. For fungi, you have to be eukaryotic. And you have to be multicellular. Asterix. So there is an exception to this multicellular rule. Uh, there's a singular exception, and that is um, yeast. 
East is single cellular, but still fungi. And the why to that is is ridiculous. The why is, uh, yeah, we'd like to classify it as something different, but uh, we had, can't can't agree on a new system yet, on a new um, a kingdom system. And so we're waiting to reclassify yeast until we have more kingdoms. And even though we don't have more kingdoms, so it just remains in that kingdom. Uh, even though it's lacking one of the main things that all fungi have in common, which is multicellular. Yeast is single cellular, okay? All fungi have to be heterotrophic. They have to be heterotrophic and they have to have what's called absorptive nutrition. Oopsies. Have to have absorptive nutrition. So when we say absorptive nutrition, what we mean is that they don't ingest food. Fungi do not ingest food. Instead, what they do is they um, release exoenzymes or they secrete these enzymes called exoenzymes and they digest all of their food outside the body, right? And then they just pull in the monomers only, right? So they never ingest like a full chunk of food. They only ingest the monomers because the chunk of food will remain outside the body and they'll just release the enzymes onto it. Let's say exoenzymes. are secreted and used to digest food outside the body. Monomers are then absorbed. The last classification, the last uh, characteristic rather that fungi have to have is they have to have cell walls that are made out of chitin. made out of chitin. Chitin is also the um, polysaccharide that uh, makes up the exoskeleton of insects uh, and it makes up the cell wall of fungi. Um, so yeast does all this stuff. Yeast is heterotrophic, it's got absorptive nutrition, it's got cell walls that are made out of uh, chitin, and so it's pretty close to being able to get in here. It just doesn't have this thing, and, um, and and so that's why it's kind of still allowed to be in there, and also because there's no other place for it, or there is another place for it, but that place is terrible, and you'll see that in a second, okay? Let's talk about plantae. The plant kingdom. Interestingly enough, in the three kingdom system, um, which was what we had before the five kingdom system, Plants and fungi were together, and we used to think that fungi were photosynthetic uh, and that they could make their own food. But turns out they cannot, and so they needed to be in a separate grouping. Uh, so we divided up fungi in plantae. All right. <clears throat> Eukaryotic and multicellular. Everybody in this grouping follows these rules. But we're okay, we can eukaryotic and multicellular. They have to be photosynthetic autotrophs. Asterix. 
okay? And the asterisk for this is that they had to have been photosynthetic autotrophs at some point during their evolution. Okay, so um, where does this come in? So there's a grouping of plants that we refer to as epiphytes. Epa means um, of surface and um, phyte it means plant. So they're surface plants. Um, basically, these are plants that live on other plants. A good example of this would be uh, like ball pine or Spanish moss. Those are the ones that we have around here. The ball pines are like little weird um, white things that grow in uh, oak trees and Spanish moss. I think you know what Spanish moss is, right? Even though it's not a moss at all, it's a flowering plant, but that's okay. Um, those two plants are plants that grow on other plants, right? So they're called epiphytes. Both those uh, examples that I gave, ball pine and Spanish moss, those are both photosynthetic, but there are other ones, other epiphytes, that over the years have um, adapted to the point where they've just figured out, hey, it's much easier instead of um, trying to be photosynthetic, even because I'm being covered up by this other plant, I can just put my roots into the plant that I'm growing on and steal food from them. So they're parasites, mm -hmm. right? We call them parasitic epiphytes and they have almost completely lost their ability to produce um, chlorophyll and they don't go through photosynthesis, right? And so in those plants, they're still classified as plants because they used to be able to go through photosynthesis, but they just sort of figured out a different way to survive. And so uh, they're no longer photosynthetic autotrophs. They are heterotrophs. They're, they're consuming um, uh, organic compounds that are produced by another organism, uh, but they used to be autotrophs. And so, so they, get, they get put under this group still, okay? Um, all plants have to have uh, cell walls made out of cellulose. Cell walls made from cellulose. Now, the interesting thing about this, um, the kind of alarming thing, is that you guys, through your entire um, school career, have learned that if you are uh, looking at a cell and that cell has a cell wall, you've been trained to say cell walls are associated with plants. So you look at it, and, oh look, it's got a cell wall, so it's got to be a plant cell. What have we learned so far? All of these have cell walls. Plants have cell walls, fungi have cell walls, uh, all of the um, uh, kingdom of Monera, so bacteria and archaea, they have cell walls, right? The only thing that you can actually know is that it's not an animal, right? So animals, or animalia, has some characteristics. They have to be eukaryotic and multicellular. Again, there's nothing that breaks these rules for for animals. So we can say both of those are good. The other defining characteristic of the kingdom animalia are two types of cells, nerve cells and muscle cells, that then um, are, are broadened into nerve tissue and muscle tissue. In other words, being able to sense stimuli and then be able to respond to that stimuli. That's something that is um, unique to this kingdom. We're going to throw an asterisk on it there. Okay. This is perhaps the most ridiculous of all of the um, 
exceptions, we further divide the kingdom Animalia into two groups, right? So the basic term for animals are, um, what are these things called? Metazoans, right? Uh, zoan means animal-like, actually. So uh, metazoans are all animals, okay? And then we divide it into another group called the eumetazoans, which are the true animals, right? So we've got animals and then true animals. Uh, and so we can say that um, true animals... which are the eumetazoans, have nerve and muscle tissue. Metazoans do not. Now, why is this ridiculous that we make this whole exception and we make these two other groups? Because there's only one um, grouping that goes into the metazoans, and that's the grouping periphera, which are um, sponges, sea sponges, right? And uh, the more we learn about sea sponges, the more they are just not like animals at all. Uh, they, they shouldn't even be classified in that grouping. It doesn't make any sense. They don't, they don't have all, any of the other characteristics of animals, not even like the developmental characteristics. So uh, they just haven't been moved yet. Why haven't they been moved yet? Well, because we're, we're going to definitely make this new system of kingdoms that has more and we can find a better place for it. This has been going on for like 15 years now. So it's not great, but we go with it because it's all we got. Okay? Um, Next thing, no cell wall. They are not allowed to have cell walls. And they have to be heterotrophic. Asterisk. Now they actually do have to be heterotrophic, so we're gonna, even though it's got an asterisk, we're gonna um, highlight that one. But um, the asterisk here is that they can be heterotrophic as well as something else. They just have to be heterotrophs as their main form of nutrition. Now this is something that's come up really recently actually. Um, I think it was like two years ago they published this study on, um, on aphids. You guys know what aphids are? They're those little insects that jump around on, uh, on the grass, right? And there's like three different types of aphids. Um, there, actually there's like tons of different species. But uh, within the species, the, s the single species that they were studying, there were three different types, three different color morphs they thought. There were the white ones, the orange ones, and the green ones, right? And uh, what they figured out was that they all started out white, right? And um, what they do is the green ones, they would eat, uh, you know, grass or something like that. And then instead of fully digesting the chloroplasts, they would keep the chloroplasts and they would move them to the surface of their skin and that would make them green in color. And we, you know, we kind of knew this for a while and, and we knew that, the, that it was sort of helpful because they would be more camouflaged then. But recently that there's been a study done uh, that shows that they actually can use those chloroplasts still. They do sort of like the light reactions um, in order to get ATP. And the reason is, is ridiculous. So um, aphids, they, they're, if you've never seen one, they can jump really, really far. Like for their size, they can jump like, you know, a million times the distance of their body or something like that. Okay. And as you can imagine, being able to jump a million times the distance of your body takes a lot of energy out of you. So they get like three jumps or so with all the ATP in their body. So if they jump three times and at the end of the third jump, they don't land on a food source, they're just like paralyzed because they can't move anymore because they ran out of ATP and they'll just die there, right? So what they did in the study was they, um, somebody had, had sort of observed that the green ones um, if they jumped three times and didn't land on a food source, they would remain um, still for a long period of time, and then they would be able to jump again. Whereas the white ones, they would just die. They would remain still forever until they starve to death and die. 
And so then they did a controlled study where they did this with, um, with light and without light, and they showed that the green one will just stay still and die if it's not exposed to light in that time uh, afterwards. But if you do expose it to light, it can save up enough ATP by going through something similar to the light reactions to be able to jump again and hopefully land on food source, right? So is it photosynthetic? doing the light reactions, right? So that's sort of like photosynthesis. Is it, ma is it making its own chloroplasts? No, right? It's, it's eating plants and it's just taking the chloroplasts from them, right? But it's sort of going through photosynthesis, so we can put this little asterisk here and say that they have to be mostly heterotrophic because now we know that there are some organisms out there. Uh, another good organism, another uh, uh, important uh, exception to this rule is coral. Coral is photosynthetic, sort of, right? Um, coral and, and sea anemones and stuff like that, they have um, algae growing inside them that's called um, zosin, zosintheli. And uh, the zosintheli, it, uh, it only grows inside of, um, of the coral. And so it's sort of like a symbiotic relationship, but also sort of like it's just part of that organism, like it comes over uh, when it buds off and it's always there. Um, but the coral themselves is not photosynthetic. It's this algae, this other thing that lives inside of it that um, provides the nutrients, right? And so like if you get an anemone or something like that and you put it into, let's say it's like red or green or something like that, and you put it into water uh, and you put too much light on it or something like that, it stresses it out. And one of the defense mechanisms is it expels all its zosintheli, right? And so it'll go from being red or green to being like a whitish clear color because then there's no more algae in there and it just waits for the zosintheli to start building back up uh, inside of it, right? So weird stuff. Uh, what's up? Are carnivorous plants heterotrophic or uh, No, it is a myth. So, so, um, when we talk about carnivorous plants, ones like the pitcher plant and um, the Venus flytrap and stuff, they are doing something really cool, but it's not heterotrophic. To be a heterotroph means that you are going to get carbon and energy from the things that you're consuming. In the case of, heter of um, uh, carnivorous plants, all they're doing is fertilizing the soil around them. So their adaptation, uh, the thing that like pitcher plants and Venus flytraps do that uh, gives them a leg up over the competition is that they can grow in soil that's really nutrient poor, okay? Specifically, um, plants need a lot of phosphorus in the soil and they need a lot of nitrogen in the soil, okay? And um, these plants, these carnivorous plants, they can start growing in areas that don't have a lot of nitrogen, don't have a lot of phosphorus. And what they do is they catch insects, right? And instead of eating the insects, they just kill them and then drop their bodies onto the ground. And when they drop their bodies onto the ground, the bodies decay and they release nitrogen and phosphorus as they decay. And so basically they're just fertilizing the soil around them by killing organisms and allowing them to decay directly around the root system so that they can get the nitrogen and the phosphorus from them. But they're not getting any carbon source and they're not getting any um, energy source from them. All right. Um, the last kingdom, the kingdom Protista. is the worst. This is the biggest offender of all of the five kingdom system and why the five kingdom system needs to go. Okay. Step one to get into Protista, you have to be eukaryotic. There are no exceptions to this rule. Eukaryotic. No prokaryotes in there. So this is one of the most difficult things for people to remember is that the kingdom Protista, Protista does not contain prokaryotes. I know that's confusing. Everybody wants to say the kingdom Protista contains prokaryotes. It does not. The kingdom Protista only contains eukaryotes. Okay? Okay. So that's step one for being accepted into the kingdom Protista. Step two, you must not fit in any other kingdom. And that's it. Those are the two uh, characteristics that you have to have to fit into the kingdom Protista. 
So that means that you could be almost like a fungus, right? And not get into the fungi kingdom for some reason. And then you're a protist. You could be almost like an animal and not get into the animal kingdom for some reason. And then you're a protist, right? And so within the kingdom protista, there are three subgroups, okay? First subgroup are called the protozoans. And those are animal-like protists. There's the grouping of algae. Those are plant-like protists. And there's a grouping called the slime molds. And those are fungi-like protists. <coughs> This kingdom is ridiculously diverse, crazy diverse. Uh, kelp, kelp that's like the, the big seaweed, right? That's not a plant, it's a protist, right? So it's got some little thing, it's the fact that it's uh, colonial, it's, uh, it has to do with uh, um, the way that the cells come together in kelp, right? Uh, and so it can't get classified in the plant kingdom. It's basically like a plant, but it's not. What's up? Why aren't metazoans or like Spanish moss in this category? You'd think that they should be. And they probably, when they get um, reclassified to make uh, a kingdom that's animal-like but not, and plant-like that's but not, but fungi-like but not, those, they'll probably get reclassified. But for now, they're staying in the um, their original classification group, which is bad. Yeah? Where would a sponge be reclassified? A sponge would be classified to animal-like, an animal-like. Yeah, yeah. So, so the very first thing, the one that pretty much all of these new kingdom systems um, agree on is instead of just having the kingdom protista, they should have the kingdom protozoa, the kingdom algae, and the kingdom slime molds or whatever, right? And so these would be three separate things, and then we could push more stuff into there without having it be ridiculous. So they would be reclassified as things that were animal-like, but not animals, whatever that new grouping would be. Anybody have any questions on this stuff? Again, the Kingdom Protista is sort of like just the junk drawer of, of uh, the Kingdom system. If you can't fit anywhere else, that's where you go.